God who created the heavens and the earth wants to stop, listen, and commune with each and every one of us. As I look in this room, I only want to talk to some of you before I get tired of talking, right? We're human. We just can't take so much. But he, he wants to talk to every single one of us, even at the same time. It doesn't matter. Can you just imagine what a privilege it is? And oftentimes, it's one that we take for granted. But I wonder if anyone here has ever thought, how should I pray? Am I praying any good? Is it good? Is the Lord hearing any of the prayers? How do other people pray? How long am I supposed to pray? How do I know if it's a good prayer? Anybody ever ask themselves these questions? Sometimes we often spend more time asking these questions than we do praying. Right? Anyone here ever really wanted to get, like, down and spend some good time in prayer? Like, you just feel it in your heart. You need to do it. You know that some stuff has been happening in your life, and you want to push everything aside because you need to talk to God. Anybody ever been there? Like, you know it's a necessity. It has to happen. Or maybe your heart is so full. Because of the goodness of God in your life that you cannot wait to get away and to spend time thanking him. That's what we want to do sometimes. Or maybe we've got a big decision to make and we don't want to get it wrong. And we're like, Lord, we're going to push everything aside because I need you right now. Because the Lord, always, he already knows what to do, right? We want to get to it. Make sure we get to him and, and talk to him about those things. And, you know, you're getting ready. You're posturing yourself in prayer. And you are about to get into it. And your phone rings. No, let me see what's going on here. You know, oh, I've been avoiding this phone call with this person. But I can't avoid it anymore. And you need to, to answer the phone, right? Or maybe you're getting ready, you're getting into that posture of prayer. And I got an eye watch, and it taps me. <gasps> Somebody's texting me or something's happening, and I look, and it's, no, my watch is just disappointed. I haven't closed as much rings as I did the day before, and it's letting me know how I'm failing in life right now, okay, because my steps are down or something like that, you know. And it's like, okay, you've got these interruptions, right, and you're like, no, I just got to get to a place. I just need to get into prayer. I need to right now. And you're getting ready to pray, and you hear your child, Mama, I need bacon. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but this is something I hear possibly up to three times a day in my house, okay? We have a bacon boy. That is what he eats. I need bacon. And it's not microwavable bacon. I, I cook it on the stove, and it takes time. It's like, can I just be done cooking this bacon now? I got stuff to do, okay? All of these things are happening. And before you know it, the day is nearly past, and you're desperate to get before the Lord. You're exhausted. Your mind has been wandering, and you need some alone time. You know what it feels like. Just you and him. You know who knew all about this? Jesus. Let me, um, we're going to talk about some times today that we see where Jesus experienced the same thing. He was tired. He was exhausted. He needed time to be with his father, and yet the people never stopped needing him. His disciples seemed to always interrupt, and yet we see how Jesus' compassion rose up instead of his frustration. Interruptions are part of life. They are not planned, and they just happen. How do we react in those times? Will we use the interruptions to teach, train, and correct the people around us in the ways of the Lord? If you're a parent in the room, I just want to encourage you right now. You're trying to spend time with the Lord, either in prayer or reading the word, and your child tends to interrupt you or needs you, and that happens. A lot, like all, all, all day long. I want to encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity and invite them into those moments with you. If you're praying, teach them how to pray. Let them come and pray with you. 
if you're reading the word, let them see you read the word. Maybe share something about the Bible with them. Oh, this is a book I'm reading. It's the book of John. This is part of the New Testament. Start explaining. Take those moments of opportunity to do that with your kids. Because they're seeing you build a relationship with God, right? And they know that that's a normal thing to do. And they're going to want to desire to do that as well. So I just want to just to say that to you. Allow them to overhear you praying for a friend in need. Something. Let them hear you pray about something, even if you're coming face to face with God and asking forgiveness for something. Because they need to know they need to do it too, right? That's how we teach and how we train and how we correct our children. So what we're going to do right now is uh, before we get into the real meat of what we're talking about today, we're going to look at some times when Jesus needed to get alone with his father and he was interrupted, okay? So let's check out this first scripture here. It says, that evening at sundown, they brought to him, we're talking about Jesus here, all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning. Okay, so we see here Jesus is exhausted. Spent time with the whole city healing them, okay? He rises very early in the morning while it's still dark. He departed and went out to a desolate place. He wanted to get away from everybody. Desperate, desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him. And they said, everybody's looking for you. Jesus just wanted to get away and spend time with his father. Jesus, everybody's looking for you. What are you doing over here? We see again in another scripture. This is a different time. That was Mark 132. Now we're going to skip to Matthew here, Matthew chapter 14. And in the beginning of Matthew 14, we hear that Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. He has been killed. And so when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. He is grieved by death right now, and he needs time to be alone. So he's went by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, though, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. And he healed their sick. Grieved by death and tired in body, right? And yet here we is. And so during this time, we're going to skip a little bit, but during Matthew chapter 14, we see that Jesus, he, he teaches this whole crowd of people, and it's over 5,000 people that are there. And not only does he teach them all, but then he feeds them all, and then he sends them on their way home. He is fatigued in body by this. And so this is what he does after this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. Hey, y'all, just go ahead. Go on out. Go, 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 okay? After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Desolate places and mountains, okay? Jesus is climbing a mountain to get away, okay? To, get, to be by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land. Remember the boat the disciples are on? And the boat was being buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. It's time for a water rescue, okay? Shortly before dawn, Jesus goes out to them walking on the lake, okay? He's on a mountain to spend time alone with the Lord in prayer. The disciples are in need because they are on a boat. There is a storm occurring. So now he's got to go and rescue them, okay? He's walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. And Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, 
tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, come. Jesus can't even take a walk on the water by himself, okay? <laughs> Somebody's got to be with him right then and there, okay? He can't, he can't even go for a walk on the water. Here he is. All of these times, right? Here's another time. This one, this one has nothing to do with prayer, but I just find it interesting. Jesus is trying to take a nap, and he's interrupted here as well. Here, Matthew 8, 23 through 27 says, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. So, I mean, Jesus did go to them and say, follow me, and they did it. Okay, they made sure that they did it. They weren't going to miss nothing. But here they are, they're on a boat. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. I'm going to show you one more scripture, and this time the disciples, they get it right. Luke 11, 1 says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, he had the time to finish. Isn't that nice? When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. There was something about the way that Jesus prayed. They needed to know what it was. So I've entitled today's sermon, The Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the love that you bestow upon us. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in your word you teach us to pray. And God, for some of us, we might treat prayer like a chore. But today, God, I pray you open our eyes. Help us to see it in a whole new way. Teach us to pray and how to spend time with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. I must tell you, this is a series on repurposing prayers and finding prayers in the scripture and repurposing them for ourselves. However, I've got to tell you, this is the Lord's prayer. I ain't repurposing nothing, okay? I'm not touching that. I'm not going to repurpose this prayer. It's his prayer, and we're just going to break it down and talk about what it means, okay, and how to, to develop this kind of prayer in our lives. And so uh, he teaches the disciples how to pray. He's modeling it for them. But before he models it for them, he prepares their hearts for prayer. And by the way, he's not going to say during this prayer, he's not going to say, say this prayer, he's going to say, pray like this, okay? So we're not getting caught up in just the Lord's prayer, but we're seeing how he's asking us to pray, how we're going to develop this prayer. But first he prepares their hearts, like I said, so let's look at this. And when you pray, this is right before it gets into the Lord's prayer, it says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. See, it's not where they're praying that's the issue, okay? It's because they want to be seen by others, okay? Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Because see, people in that time, they actually wanted to be caught praying so that people could hear them pray. People could be impressed by how they prayed. It was, that was their heart behind it. It wasn't for Jesus. It was for others, okay? And that's not the way we're supposed to pray. That's, that's not what it is. These hypocrites were praying not to be heard by God, but to be seen by men. This is an example of when people pray to impress or teach others instead of genuinely pouring out their hearts before God, okay? When we mouth words towards God while we're trying to impress others, it's kind of just like using God as a tool to impress others. And that's why he says here, he says, um, when you do this, you receive the reward because what we're doing is we're not building up rewards in heaven because we've already been rewarded by the accolades of men. 
there's not room for reward in heaven when we have already received the reward that we chose to receive from earthly man, okay? And it says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Anybody here ever thought, I just can't pray long enough? How do other people pray so long? What's wrong with me that I can't pray for 35 minutes in front of people? There is nothing wrong with you for not being able to pray for 35 minutes. But when you're in it, man, and you're, you're with, with him, if you can pray 35 minutes, go for it, okay? But don't, don't let man tell you how long and if your prayer was worth something because it wasn't long enough, okay? So think that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Before you ask him. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not surprising God. Because he already knows everything that's gone on in our life and in the day and in the weeks behind and all that, all this stuff. He already knows these things, right? We get the idea of, of, of praying in a private place where we can't impress nobody but God. And I just want to say, Jesus isn't saying we can't pray in public, okay? Our prayers should always be directed to God and not towards man. And we need to ask, are we trying to impress God with our many words? Or in other words, it's not the length of our prayer that gets our prayers answered. We're not praying to inform God of anything because he already knows it all. We pray to commune with him and bring every need and every worry before his throne. So he says here, he begins, he says, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So let's, let's break this prayer down and see what, God, what Jesus is trying to teach us to do. So our Father in heaven, this is a time to connect with God relationally. Okay. And it says, our Father in heaven. This is the moment when you get before the Lord and you realize it's not on you anymore. Because you're screaming out to the Father. It's your cry for help. When you cry for your father, he know, you know he's coming to the rescue. I got to tell you, when I was a kid, um, we had a goat. And I find it funny that I'm going to share the story because I'm pretty sure just a few weeks ago, Pastor Bianca shared a story about a goat. And I thought, oh, no, did my daddy sell her daddy, that mean goat? <laughs> that sounds like my goat, okay? We had a goat. Its name was Buster. And the name fit him well. He was mean. He was a mean goat. You would be out there. You would feed him from your hand. And he's just sweet and wagging his tail and eating, eating the grass. And you turn to get some more grass. You should not have turned your back. Okay? You turn to get the grass and boom! You get hit in the backside. Fall to the ground. It's now his head is smushing you up against a car over and over and over and over again. He's a mean mean goat, okay? He was strong. So my dad was like, okay, he, he won't stay in the fence, so he, he got a cinder block <laughs> and, it, and attached to him, to, to him by a collar, okay? That goat picked it up and drug it around, okay? <laughs> it was, he was a strong goat. And one day I was going out to the car and I see from a distance the goat is out there. I see the fury in its eyes. And I know I am in trouble. I jump on the roof of the car. And here it is, like a dog, okay, like a rabid dog trying to get me from the car. And I scream out, Daddy! My daddy's got to come and rescue me. He's got to take the goat away so I can get down from the car, right? When we say, Daddy, that's what we're doing. Our Father in heaven. You know, it was very unusual for the Jews of that day to call God Father because they considered it too intimate. Our Father in heaven. Also, do you see it says our Father? It's not just my Father. 
So when I'm praying, I understand that there is a whole family around me and that I am praying for them. We are praying collectively together to our Father in heaven because we are in this together, okay? Romans 8.15 tells us you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. That's how we go to him. We go to him as our father. Next one is, hallowed be your name. I always wondered what this meant, you know, as a kid. I was like, what does that mean? Hallowed? Hallowed be his name. It means to be greatly revered and honored, holy. This is a time where we worship his name. We spend time worshiping him. Proverbs 9, 10 tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Sometimes we check prayer off of our daily to-do list. Or do we do it to honor him with our lips and our lives? That's a question we ask ourselves. We cannot miss the joy that comes from spending time with God in prayer. It's not about a task that being accomplished. It's a relationship to be enjoyed. And his name is worthy of that. Because we have to understand that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and when I go before God, I know that one day I will stand before a holy God. And it will be me and it will be him. There will be no husband by my side. There will be no parents behind me. There will be no children in front of me. There will not be a best friend to have my back. It is me and him. And every single one of us will stand one day and we will give an account. So when we do this, we are revering his name. The power of life and death is in him, okay? And sometimes we don't honor him enough. And we coerce ourselves into thinking somehow God will be okay with our sin. God will understand why I had to do it this way. We can't do that, church. We can't afford to do that, church. You cannot lie to yourself and you cannot lie to him. We will stand before a holy God. And the only way that I know that I can do that without fear and trembling is because I have accepted his payment for my debt. That is the only way that I know I can do this, okay? And we'll get more to that in a minute. But I want you to understand this is what we're doing. We're worshiping his name. Proverbs 8.10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. All right, let's move to the next one here. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What this means is we need to be praying his agenda first. His agenda. The right kind of prayer has a passion for God's glory and agenda. His name, his kingdom, and his will have the top priority. It's natural to try to guard our own name and reputation, but we must resist the tendency to protect and promote ourselves first and instead put God's name, kingdom, and will first. Not just to put him first, by the way, in our day, but to put him first in everything. Put his kingdom first in my marriage. I can't have a bad marriage if I'm putting God's kingdom first. Put him first in my parenting can't be a bad parent if I'm putting God's kingdom first. Put him first in my job. My job is to, to serve God by serving you, all of you. And you know what? Sometimes I get fatigued and I get worn out from doing it. And that's when I need to realize, is it because I'm putting my agenda first? Did I ask God what his will was for me to accomplish this week or did I make a to-do list for it? And that's why I'm worn out. Did I put him first? Luke chapter 12 tells us how the birds of the field are well taken care of by the Father. And how the flowers are clothed in beauty. 
And then goes on to warn us that we shouldn't worry about what we'll eat and what we'll drink, right? Luke 12, 31 concludes by saying, for all the nations of the world seek after these things. And your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom and those things will be added to you. That's what he's telling us to do. Pray his agenda first. Give us this day our daily bread. We need to depend on God for everything. And that does not sound fun, does it? Because we like to prepare. We like to get stuff done. We like to have things on our own. We want to depend on ourselves. It's natural to want to do that, and we do. I don't even like other people doing stuff for me. No, I will do it. Okay, that, that's how we are, right? But we need to depend on him for everything. Psalms 121, 1 through 2 tells us, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We've got to depend on him for everything, everything. Are we doing things, you know, out of fear? Or are we depending on him to take care of the things that we need, right? What's our motivation here? This is what he's telling us to do. Depend on him for everything because he wants us to depend on him, and he can handle it, and we're trying to do it on our own. He wants us to depend on him for everything. Let's go to the next one here. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive and be forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Because you see, this is a time when we're in prayer with the Father and we say, God, search me and know my heart. This is a time of honesty between the Lord what kind of sins have I been committing? What am I holding on to during this time? And sometimes we don't like that honesty, do we? We just want to pretend it's not happening. This is a time where we come before the Lord and we say, Lord, if there's any offensive weight in me, lead me in the way everlasting. Search my heart, God. We need to forgive and be forgiven because, you see, I incurred a debt I could not pay. And my debt is due to sin and there's nothing I can do to get rid of that debt. It was too great until Jesus. Jesus paid the debt for my sin, and it was a great debt. And you see, when we choose to be forgiven by him, but then we hold on to unforgiveness towards others, we're saying their, great was the greater, their debt was greater than ours because theirs is too bad to be forgiven. <laughs> The Lord has forgiven us a great debt. This is a time when we need to ask him to search our heart. Is, is there anything that I'm doing, Lord? Is there an offensive way in me that I'm not even aware of? Or the sins I'm doing that I don't even realize are sin? Wake me up, Father. Help me to forgive and to let go. Let go of some stuff. Because you cannot move forward with God if you are being drugged down with unforgiveness. You know something I notice about unforgiveness? I've been hearing different people's stories and thinking about things. And sometimes we're mad at everybody. We've got unforgiveness in our hearts towards our mama. My mama did this. And sometimes it's very true. And it's hurtful. Sometimes it's a sibling. And it's family. Sometimes it's a coworker. Sometimes it's people who have wronged us and hurt us. And that happens. But um, you know who I notice no one ever blames for that? Is the devil. We spend time blaming others. We spend time blaming God. We spend time blaming ourselves. And the only person we haven't blamed is Satan. Sometimes we've got to see beyond what is there. And that's why we've got to seek forgiveness. It's going to lead us into our next one here. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We have to engage in spiritual warfare. There are things at play that we can't see with our natural eyes. Unforgiveness being one of them. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 
There are things going on around us that we might not even recognize and understand unless the Holy Spirit lets us know. And we've got to ask him. And just in case anyone here is wondering, it says, lead us not into temptation. Will the Lord do that? Let's read this scripture, James 1, 13 through 15. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Okay? We will be tried. We will be tested. Temptations are everywhere. Okay? It is coming. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Here's the scary part. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Sobering scriptures. As you see here, um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We understand that things are going on that maybe we are um, naturally tempted to do, right? And if we're praying about it, though, we're going to be more aware and see it coming. That's, that's what it's for. And sometimes when we are actively involved in sin like this, we get this guilt, okay? And we want to run from God because of the guilt of our sin. But that's when we need to run to him. Okay, we've got to run to him. Let's talk about guilt versus conviction, okay? Because guilt is a tactic from Satan, Conviction is how the Holy Spirit leads us, okay? There's a difference here. God may bring conviction, but he doesn't bring guilt. And the trouble is they often feel the same. The difference is that conviction pulls you back to the Father, and guilt drives you away. So recognize that when that's happening in your life. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This is time for us to express faith in God's ability and his ability. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. So good. We, it's time for us to release and express our faith in God's ability. So after we have prayed all of these things, then we release it to God. We express faith in his ability. And then I find it interesting, as we're getting ready to close here, that after Jesus goes through this prayer, he ends it again talking about more forgiveness. Matthew 6, 14 through 15 says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Forgiveness is required for those who have been forgiven. We don't get the luxury of holding on to our bitterness towards other people. And it is a luxury one cannot afford. Church, the Father has given us salvation for free. Jesus paid the price for our sins, for our trespasses. But some of us haven't been forgiven yet. Because we haven't asked for it. We haven't accepted the gift that Jesus so freely gives us. If you're here today and you find yourself trapped by sin, trapped with unforgiveness, I need to tell you, you don't have to leave that way today. You need to decide today if you will choose his gift of forgiveness and salvation. Time is not a luxury we can afford. The Bible tells us that one day in his courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. You don't want to miss out on eternity with your Savior. Okay? So we're going to close this time right now. I want to pray for people here who may not have a genuine relationship with God yet. And I pray that as we have been going through this sermon, the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart to draw you into a deeper relationship with him so that you can leave today not feeling guilt and condemnation from your prayer life, uh, the lack of your prayer life, from how you've been omitting the Lord out of your life or maybe never putting him in your life in the first place, okay? 
This is a time right now where those kind of things can change. And so if you're here today and, and you would like to give your life to the Lord, we're going to pray right now to do that. If everyone here could just close your eyes. You can pray this prayer with me if you'd like to do this. Our Father, thank you for loving me. I know that you sent your son Jesus to pay a debt I could not pay. I accept his free gift. Jesus, please come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And right now, I actually just want to take a moment and let you think about that. Bring up some of that sin to the Father right now. Forgive me of my sins, Father. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we'd love to know about it. You can text the word Jesus to 630-526-6704. We just want to be able to follow up with you. We want to be able to give you a free gift, a Bible, if you don't have